to that. You know, when you read the great poets or the philosophers, or for that matter, even the scientists, they are passionately committed to their discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, when you read the works of a Tennyson or a, a Yeats or Keats or whatever, you see that passion mm -hmm. into the poetry. Well, the word, the, the word of God has a combination mm -hmm. of prescriptive truth, descriptive truth, mm -hmm. poetry, the mm -hmm. Psalms and all. Why not mm -hmm. have the same intensity and passion mm -hmm. that uh, we, we should be displaying, especially since this is life-changing truth? Yeah. So thank you for that comment, oh. and uh, we hope it will ever remain so. At the base of it all, though, a humility of heart, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, even the voice we have mm -hmm. is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. That voice could go on a given day. Mm -hmm. So we have to lean on him, draw from him, and realize this is for him. Mm -hmm. And we have about 47 full-time apologists wow. on our team based in 15 countries, started in 1984 in Toronto, mm -hmm. which was really the base from which where it all began. So, so it is RZIM, not RZIM? <laughs> That's true. You're absolutely yeah, yeah, okay. right, <laughs> yes. We have to. The funny thing is, though, you know what? My name, Ravi, mm -hmm. Canadians, for some reason, ever since I've been here, like to go as a Ravi, you know, which is really not right. What is it? Yeah, it's a... Technically, Ravi, Ravi is that it rhymes with lovey and dovey, okay. but they were more comfortable with Ravi in my travels, so I go right. with that. That's okay. also okay. But it's very interesting. My wife, who's Canadian, says, I wonder why we've always gone the route of Ravi, which yeah. is the least of the yeah. correct pronunciations. That's all right. This yeah. is home, yes. and I'm happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you. As I was thinking about what I would ask you, uh, I, began, I began to become a little bit overwhelmed uh -huh. because I realized I would much prefer just to have maybe two weeks together, just one-on-one, -on -one, sure. where you and I can just sit here and just talk for, for two sure. weeks straight. I, I have a lot to ask you. Okay. But in 30 minutes, it's going to be a little bit different. So sure. I thought, you know, what's the best use of our time? I could just, you know, the temptation is just to kind of pepper you with all kinds of apologetic questions. On what basis can we trust the authority of the Bible? How do we, you know, reconcile the biblical God with the existence of suffering and evil, that kind of thing, and on and on. Over the last four decades and more, you've written, though, extensively on those things. You've spoken extensively, and I figure that's what Google's for. That's what YouTube's for. People can go there. They can find exactly True. what you say True. on those kinds of things. What I would like to do in, in the next few minutes together is really take advantage of your very unique, historical, global perspective uh, and, and just ask you to help us a little bit. Sure. Hel ask us a little bit to help us in the cultural moment that we find ourselves in, especially here in the West, maybe even the Northwest. But um, So I I'd like to ask for your help in sure. that. So let me just phrase uh, the first question, just really general, give you a couple, and then let you kind of take it, and we'll go from there. Um, but where are we today, in your estimation, as you see what's going on around the world, as you've studied history, where are we today culturally and in the church how are we supposed to kind of make sense of the rapid, rapid changes, both spiritually and morally, taking place in culture around us? And, and like, where are we headed culturally and as the church? Where are we going? What, what are you seeing these days? It's a great question. Really, uh, not just great in the sense of its importance, but in the need to address it wisely. You know, Matt, I arrived in Canada when I was 20 years old. It's 1966 mm -hmm. when I came to Canada. I'll never forget when I, I, my brother and I got into a rooming house there. We're paying $8 a week, mm -hmm. you know, because the Indian government would only give you a limited amount of money for an exchange. We had to find jobs and all of that. All, the, all that's the backdrop. Mm -hmm. But I still remember when I arrived, the so-called hippie movement mm -hmm was at its peak. Mm -hmm. You know, in Toronto, if you went to Yorkville, you'd see them sitting around, the hairstyles were different, the mm -hmm. clothing was different, it was the thick of the Vietnam War mm -hmm. in the United States being involved, the draft was on, there was a discontent mm -hmm. and a rejection of authority. Mm -hmm. That was really what was going on. The church didn't come to terms with that. When I say the church, it's us as mm -hmm. we yeah. were part of the church. I was part of the church then. We just thought of it as something passing, you know, a rebellion and mm -hmm. put it down to that and that we, it would weather, it would go away. It didn't. Mm -hmm. And we were too late on the response. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Everett Coop at that time, and Francis Schaeffer writing their books, you know, Whatever Happened to the Human Race. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing uh, Schaeffer and Coop speaking at Ryerson mm -hmm. in Toronto. Mm -hmm. 
and that was, if I'm not mistaken, late 70s or maybe, yeah, late 70s. And the, he was calling the church mm-hmm. on this matter, mm-hmm. saying, you know, the God who is there, the escape from reason, mm-hmm. what are we doing with the cultural war, cultural issues? Because he also spoke about the arts. And now uh, two generations have gone by. Mm-hmm. And now we're wondering what's happened now. Yeah. Those individuals became faculty members and university professors, and it has now replicated with greater intensity. So where are we now? We are in a cultural no man's land. Mm -hmm. They were challenging authority. They were rejecting established absolutes. They didn't accept the authority of the church or of politics of anything. Sort of a secular reformation, Mm -hmm. except there was nothing Mm -hmm. to replace Mm -hmm. what it was they were challenging. So that's what we're facing Mm -hmm. uh, all across the West. And the second phenomenon is the influx of other cultures. Pluralism is a reality. Mm -hmm. So as the West was becoming secular Mm -hmm. and pluralism became a real reality, and then privatization came about where we are telling people, believe whatever you want, but keep it to the private. Don't become, bring it to the public square. Mm-hmm. And yet in the public square, were all the important questions of life on sexuality, on marriage, on law, on relationship, mm-hmm. on absolutes, on relativism. And yet the faith was kept out of dealing with this. We are right now on the high seas without chart or compass. Mm-hmm. But the good news is, This generation Mm -hmm. is waking up to the entailments of the loss of the absolutes Mm -hmm. of the previous one. Mm -hmm. So they are asking, where are we heading? Mm -hmm. What are we doing? How do we find answers? I think it is, uh, if Dickens wrote, you know, after the the revolution, French Revolution times, it was the best of times and the worst of times, Mm -hmm. my goodness, uh, he would say that with greater intensity now. So to answer it in one line, Mm -hmm. we are dealing with a generation that listens with its eyes Mm -hmm. and thinks with its feelings and does not know where to go for absolutes. Mm -hmm in directing their path. Mm -hmm. We have to listen to what they're saying, why they're saying it. Mm -hmm. And I may as well say this, academics are not gonna be happy with what I'm saying. They've given no answers. Mm -hmm. They've only given reason for rebellion. They wanted to throw everything away, but there are no answers. Mm -hmm. And that's why our young people watching the arts, Mm -hmm. listening to the academics Mm -hmm. are saying life is without meaning. You've written, um, and I want to ask you a couple questions on that, but you know, you've written, speaking of the spiritual side of things, uh, you've written that, that we should at least be grateful, uh, I'm paraphrasing you, for the new spiritualists awakening us, awakening us to a place of our need. Uh, elsewhere, uh, you've implied that, the post, that postmodern spirituality is really the expression of a universal hunger. When I read that, like as I've, as I've you know, been reading that, as I've read that, uh, that, that's upsetting to me mm-hmm. to hear that. And the, the reason why that's upsetting, what I'd like you to speak into is because, is because as I read the scripture over and over again, the Bible over and over and the, the story of redemptive history, it seems to me that the story is, is, it, it is a response to these universal human hungers and desires. That's what we have in Christian theism, I, I think. Mm-hmm. And so how have we as a church, like how did we miss that? How, how have we been so awakened to these desires, but, but the church went from being irrelevant, and this will lead to another question, but, but irrelevant to now today, we're part of the problem. Yes. When we actually think that we hold you know, the solution to these hungers and these desires, how have we missed this moment? Uh, it's very, very important that we reflect on this, what it is that we have done and are doing. You know, Martin Luther talked about history being like a drunken man reeling from one wall to the other, knocking himself senseless Mm -hmm. with every hit. Mm -hmm. And we we are creatures of extremes, and the Mm -hmm. church reacted with extreme. Mm -hmm. First, we were outright condemning that cultural upheaval, didn't know what to do with it, blocking people out from our churches Mm -hmm. who didn't look like what we wanted them to look like. And that's when the Jesus movement emerged, you know, with Chuck Smith and all. I remember being at Calvary in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. Costa Mesa Mm -hmm. at that time, and thousands of young people who would be considered counterculture Mm -hmm. who are coming and listening. But what happened after all of that? You see, we realized the music world had taken over the minds of the young. Mm -hmm. Rock music was at its peak. The groups were so heavily involved. What did the church do? You know, we've 
came to the conclusion that music is the way mm. to reach them. And it was a partial answer. Mm. It was not the complete answer. Mm. Because yes, music gives you the ability to express. It digs deep from the soul. You know, uh, it, it was... Uh, the great Scottish activist who who said, let me write the songs of a nation. Mm -hmm. I don't care who writes its laws. Mm -hmm. We have that desire to express. Mm -hmm. So what did we do? We made music the sum and substance of worship. Yeah. When it isn't, mm -hmm. it's a vital aspect yeah. of worship. It sort of is the impressive aspect of the mm -hmm. soul. The teaching has to go on. The mm -hmm. combination, if you go to the book of Acts, what were the components of worship? We forgot all about that. Mm -hmm. We forgot what the Lord's Supper is really all about, mm -hmm. pulling together all of the um, proclivities within the human heart from imagination, will, heart, touch, and all. So I think we reacted and moved to an extreme and the churches that were doing well mm -hmm. were highly emotionally driven, drawing large numbers for the privilege of expression. Mm -hmm. But there were really no answers of the mind that were given to them. And so the 18-year-olds were going into university, mm -hmm. heavily involved in worship, mm -hmm. but really no intellectual answers to the questions. Mm -hmm. And like a storm came against them mm -hmm. from the academics. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they could think of is that I feel at home in my church, mm -hmm. but I really don't know if Genesis is still valid. Can the creation yeah. story still be taken? So we divided up the individual mm -hmm. when the very concept is indivisibility mm -hmm. within the individual. And we became partially responsive and left the head removed wow. from our faith. Now the head is not the only container we have right. we have to have the emotional side of it mm -hmm. if you just come cerebrally driven and teaching 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 without emotion expression uh, you're committing as much of a danger and so some great churches that specialized in teaching but without the emotion and without the expression they ended up paying the price too we must find balance mm -hmm. and when you find balance the heart responds because the head understands, not mm -hmm. the heart responding only because the soul yearns. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, no, that's, wow, that, that's very, very helpful um, into that. Uh, and maybe because of some of that, uh, especially the lack of answers that the church was able to provide uh, to, to culture, uh, you've coined a term, Western spirituality, right. which I think is, is very important, especially here in Vancouver. I, right. I think it really works here. Right. Could you define what that means and what you're talking about yeah. by that? Well, you know, uh, there the used to be the East is not the East and the West, uh, the East is the East and the West is the West and the twain shall never meet. Mm -hmm. No more. Mm -hmm. They have not only met, they have mingled. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went out and had a nice Indian dinner last night here in Vancouver and what I would say, one of the finest Indian restaurants yeah. ever in the world. We've got good Indian food. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And when I arrived in Toronto in 66, there was only one Indian mm -hmm. restaurant in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a bit of an apology yeah. for an Indian restaurant. It yeah. was quite westernized cuisine. Well, you can do that with food to a certain degree to mm -hmm. accommodate the needs of the stomach. But when you take the influx mm -hmm. of a pantheistic worldview or even monotheistic views like Islam and mm -hmm. so on. And you put it into a mix of Western culture where we never taught our young why what we believe is true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got this mm -hmm. huge gust of pluralism coming in. And for the first time, they are listening to people with conviction mm -hmm. on other worldviews. Mm -hmm. And they say, what's happened here? How do we respond to it? So what happened was you've got the influx from the East. Mm -hmm. You've got the unpreparedness of the Western churches. Mm -hmm. You've got the academics coming in, railing against Christianity. Mm -hmm. So what was the answer? Humanity longs to be spiritual. Mm -hmm. So how could we get a spirituality? Well, if you can get a spirituality without God, that was the answer mm -hmm. to the Western mind. Mm -hmm. So humanism, you know, plays with the terms and the words. Uh, and you've got a spiritual expression from yoga and all of that, not really understanding the metaphysical underpinnings of what mm -hmm. this is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask a simple question, for example. If yoga is all that it is made out to be, mm -hmm. Why is India so corrupt? Mm -hmm. 
It is one of the most knowledgeable nations and brilliant nations in the world. Mm. Just moving aside to meditate and empty the mind of everything is not the answer. As Chesterton said, once you open your mouth, mm. you've got to put something in it mm. in order to close it. Mm -hmm. So you can't just empty the mind. Yeah. Western spirituality is sort of Western drive, Western ingenuity, Western ability to disseminate, and with Eastern thought and pantheistic worldviews of self-divinization, mm. we've ended up with a kind of a culture that can use spiritual terms, mm -hmm. but they are really empty terms. Mm -hmm. There's no transcendent, personal, moral first cause with whom you can relate. We end up relating to an impersonal, moral absolute. And so we are actually now either atheistic mm -hmm. or spiritualistic, and the goal has been the same. We have deified ourselves. Well, sp speaking of that, you, you're talking about the spiritual terminology that we use, and, and th that's actually far more important than, than yeah. maybe we realize, is how important the, the words we use are. Uh, you, you've written that the greatest casualty of our time in which we are inundated with spiritual terminology is unquestionably the truth. So the question then, uh, how can we as Christians, right, we, we necessarily put a lot of emphasis on the truth. We probably haven't done a good job, as you've, been, as you've said, we haven't done a good job of backing up why we believe what we believe, which is probably where we went wrong, mm -hmm. but we still put a great deal of emphasis on the truth. How do we now, how do we begin to engage the culture we're a part of who, who denies the, the flat-out existence of the truth? Yeah. Well, last night I was quoting Kelly Monroe from her book on uh, Finding God at Harvard or the search for God at Harvard, I forget the exact title, but I've known Kelly Monroe for years. She has a comment in her book that a Harvard student said, you know, uh, I'm allowed to believe whatever I want so long as I don't claim it to be true. Right. Uh, an astounding statement. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was speaking at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, their motto on the door mm -hmm. is to think freely is great, to think rightly is greater, mm. to think freely is great, to think rightly is greater. Yeah. A majority of the students disagree with their own motto. Mm. They think freedom of thought is more important right. than rightness of thought. Right. So that Bailey basically boils down to two things. The truth doesn't matter anymore because they're indifferent to its claims. It's the will to power and the will to meaning mm -hmm. that takes over. So. If truth is a casualty, then the next casualty is whether we really care anymore. Mm -hmm. You look at the elections in the United States right now, mm -hmm. and we are struggling to elect a candidate, and the historic reality is stark. Mm -hmm. For the first time, they say, we are choosing between two candidates yeah. whose distrust quotient is the highest yeah. ever in recent memory. So... How did they get there, though? Mm -hmm. How did they arrive at this point? Mm -hmm. It had to be from the popular vote mm -hmm. that somehow we got there. So I think the indifference to truth and the apathy towards truth has been a very serious thing in our time. Imagine if you were a pilot, if you were on a plane, mm -hmm. and the pilot is reading his instruments, and the instruments tell him he's running out of fuel, and he says, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm indifferent. Mm -hmm. I've got a job to do. I've got to get them mm -hmm. to Los Angeles or something. And I was only halfway there. And the instruments tell them, you don't have the field to take you there. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we lived with an indifference to the reality of mm -hmm. the real indicators? Mm -hmm. That's what we are doing with life. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when uh, Rebecca was pregnant with two children, it's amazing what God said to her. He didn't say two products of conception are in your womb. Mm -hmm. He didn't even say two babies are in your womb. Mm -hmm. He said two nations yeah. are in your womb. Yeah. So God who lives in the eternal now and looks to the future reminds us we had better do the same. Mm -hmm. We cannot just look at things. We have to look through them mm -hmm. and beyond them. And we have not yet paid attention to where we are headed with a present philosophy. You know, I can give you a quick illustration yeah, of this please. as a caveat. Yeah. Years ago, I read a book by a Western Canadian, Douglas Coupland, mm -hmm. and his book was yes. like, yeah, Life yeah. After God. It's a brilliant book. Yeah. And, you know, he gives an illustration in that, which was a caveat of an illustration, but I looked beyond that. Mm -hmm. Here's what he said. He was walking in a beautiful garden somewhere, and he heard the chatter of some women and he paused and he looked at them and he realized it was a group of women bereft of sight. They were blind. Mm. 
And uh, then they could hear him and asked him if he would take a picture of them. And he was puzzled by it. You know, he said, well, they're not going to see their own picture. What do they want me to do this? But to oblige, he took their picture, borrowed the camera, took their picture and gave it back. And he sort of was mystified by it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, rightly so. But there's something beyond. They may not see the pictures, but they are going to go back home. Mm-hmm. And the son or daughter or father or brother are going to see the pictures mm-hmm. and describe for them mm-hmm. what it is they were wearing, mm-hmm. what the others were wearing, what the flowers looked like, what the background looked like. They needed somebody who could see mm-hmm. to help them appreciate even more where they were. We are at a stage in cultural history where we don't have anyone who can see to describe for us what it is that has really become of us and where we are headed. And that sight comes from God alone. Yes. Yeah, it comes from God alone. uh, And thankfully, he uses people to help us discern the times that we're living in. Uh, It it is, you know, well, let me let me ask this question. A lot of I think in the church here in Vancouver in particular, um, there, there's been a certain amount of shock. Even in the last few years, we've seen it. Uh, as, as we have gone in the church from being maybe, um, you know, kind of not that important, a little bit irre- irrelevant, archaic, you know, in our thinking, that kind of thing, to now we are evil. We are the morally reprehensible ones. That's what we're finding. That's, right. And that's actually taken us by surprise. Mm-hmm. Where even in the, 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 this rapid cultural shift that we've been a part of over these last few years, like really the last decade, it's been incredible to see. Um, and, and, and so the, the question is, how much of that animosity that exists toward the church today, how much of that should the church own? And how much of that is just, you know, the... the The coming to pass of Jesus' words, you know, if the world hated me, it will hate you. But how much that are we responsible for in that we've we've missed the cultural moment and we've we've not we've not adapted to the signals? Good point. And it's a scary moment. A little bit of both. I think the church, uh, it mishandled certain Mm. situations. Uh, We were sort of preaching against things and ideas rather than engaging the person. Mm. uh, The church is a place for wounded people to come and get healed, questioning people to come and get answers, broken people to come and get mended. That's Mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus looked at the woman with the alabaster ointment, Mm -hmm. said, wherever the gospel is preached, there should also this be told of what this woman has done to me. He took one of the most broken people in the Holy Scriptures mm-hmm. to represent her story, to be told along with what mm-hmm. he came for. So we we did not handle this very well. We, we were seen as very judgmental mm-hmm. and very rejecting in the way we behaved. That's the first part of it. But the second part of it is also true. You know, we are we would rather believe a lie, as Chesterton said, truth is stranger than fiction mm-hmm. because we have made fiction to suit ourselves. Mm-hmm. And the moment we comment on anything that implicitly is a denial of someone else's life or lifestyle, what are they going to do? Sooner or later, we're going to become the bad people. Romans 1 describes it, professing themselves to be wise. You know, they became fools and gloried gloried in that which was once upon a time Mm -hmm. uh, so wrong, agreed to be wrongheaded. Mm -hmm. We have moved culturally in the direction of rights not in the direction of what is right. Mm. And so if rights override what is right, yeah. then the person who talks about what is right yeah. is going to be seen as the enemy of the one who wants to yes. talk about rights. Yeah. So we're on a collision course with that, to yeah. be real. But that's exactly what happened in our Lord's day. Mm-hmm. And so he was sent onto the cross mm-hmm. by people who found his teaching to be hostile Mm -hmm. to the privacy, not only for the world, but even within the temple precincts Mm -hmm. where the priests wanted an authoritarianism. Uh, This is a deep story. Mm -hmm. When science hit, we didn't answer. Mm -hmm. When philosophy hit, we didn't answer. When culture hit, we didn't answer. Yeah, there was smattering of answers. We have to prepare our young. They are the really the salt and the light. Mm In their arena, they have to be. They are the ones who are going to be heard because not going to be seen as from behind a lectern. Mm -hmm. And if we prepare, as somebody answered yesterday, you know, 
We need the lawyers. We need the doctors. We need the politicians. We need the ethicists. We need the street cleaners. We need the engineers. Mm -hmm. We need people in the marketplace. That's where life touches life. Because people don't normally come to hear something that they're uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. But it's you're like your own children. If you're giving them a talk, sit down mm -hmm. on the couch, I want to talk mm -hmm. to you, they fight you. But you could be sitting watching a baseball game mm -hmm. and your son is asking you some questions and you know life is being molded. Mm -hmm. You're having your popcorn in your hand, mm -hmm. you're watching a game, incidental to the game mm -hmm. is the conversation. But that conversation is molding mm -hmm. because of the setting in which it was asked mm -hmm. and the barricades are lowered mm -hmm. and say this is true. Mm -hmm. That was actually going to be my next question was, was going to be, you know, have we, have we seen this before? Because for, for people without the historical background that, that you bring and, and the, the kind of the global, uh, the reach that you have, what you're seeing around the world, it's hard to know. Sometimes, to be honest, it's just hard to know. Have, have we seen this before? Has the church been here before? Uh, wh where are we going? What, what's the way through this? Uh, so if you, could, if you could chart a course for, for the church, I'm going to be selfish here, the church in the you know, Pacific Northwest, we're kind of the epicenter of that nun zone, right? So Western spirituality, yeah, very much so. We're the, we're the nun zone people, right? No religious affiliation that we want to you know, give any kind of a label to or whatever. Um, if you could chart a way forward for us, what are a couple yeah. of the things that we should be doing? We have definitely seen this before. Okay. You know, when you see uh, the history of humanism mm -hmm. and you go back to the Renaissance, mm -hmm. which is where it's all began, you know, with da Vinci and mm -hmm. uh, the paintings of Michelangelo and all of that. Humanism came into being. The prime movers in humanism were actually Christian thinkers mm -hmm. to affirm, you know, human dignity and all. But where did it end up? it ended up with an anti-theistic mindset. Yes. So if you look at the overthrow of the church in the, during the French Revolution, mm -hmm. so you're talking about the late 1700s at that point. Uh, so you had the French philosophes and you've got the Voltaire, the Robespierre's mm -hmm. and all. When the, when the lid had been tightened upon the population mm -hmm. between the political powers that were in royalty and the demagogic mm -hmm. church, the state church, mm -hmm. when the lid blew up, both of them were thrown away. Mm -hmm. And France has not recovered. Mm. But, you know, Europe is now beginning to ask itself some questions. Yeah. Why? Because there's an influx now of the Islamic world. Mm. And by the way, people often say, you know, Islam is growing. Christianity is not. It's a false premise. Mm. You don't have the freedom to disbelieve in Islamic countries. Mm. In Iran, you dare not disbelieve publicly. Mm. You'll be in trouble. In Saudi Arabia, you dare not disbelieve. Mm. Here in the Western world, we give the people the privilege of belief or mm. disbelief. So the numbers that are being counted are really not accurate. Mm. I have heard Iranians say, if the foot of the demagogues were taken off their necks, of high percentage of them would renounce and turn mm -hmm. their back upon this mm -hmm. uh, demagogic type mm -hmm. worldview that is being enforced mm -hmm. upon them. And I think a lot of what was happening through Al-Qaeda and all of that was a reaction uh, because they were fearful of where this was headed, whether they were going to lose their young. Mm -hmm. So threat and fear came in. Now, when you look at where the church has faltered and s seen the reaction, you go back even before that. You go back to the 1500s. What was happening in the Reformation? Mm -hmm. the, the authority of the church was pit against the authority of science. Yeah. And so you've got Galileo and all coming and saying, hey, boys, you've been teaching us all kinds of false stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, what were they going with? They were going with the philosophers of science from before. Mm -hmm. It was the Ptolemaic uh, worldview, a geocentric worldview, which was false. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was Aristotelian or Ptolemy or whatever, we were following the drift of also what the secular thinkers were saying mm -hmm. and found out it was not where we needed to be. Wow. So you go back into the 1500s, you go through the 1700s, we faced this before. Yeah. And then you go into modern China, yeah. Mao Zedong, burning the seminary libraries, mm -hmm. saying this was never going to rise again. The mm -hmm. dust of the Christians is before us. The fastest growing church in the world is in wow. China yeah. today. So, yes, we've been here before. And I believe the corner will be turned very soon. And the reason it will be turned is because we will find out 
Rebellion alone does not bring right. answers. There have to be transcendent answers that address the soul. We are incurably religious, yeah. and when truth and relevance combine, meaning emerges. Oh. And I believe this is the moment for the church to oh, rise. I to hope occasion. you're right. I yeah. hope you're right. It's exciting to hear you say that, and I just I hope you're right. If I can, as we wrap up now. Okay. Um, Historians, people with a great view of history, are obviously are are obviously always the best to predict the future, to look ahead for us, right? And not to predict. I know you uh, you you foretell the word of God a lot, but I'm asking you to foretell now. Uh, so you look ten or fifteen years ahead. What do you think the the maybe one or two of the issues that the church needs <laughs> to be prepared for? What are one of one or two of those things? And maybe as we just wrap this up, maybe you could just in in a way just kind of call us to that. Uh, as we bring this to a close, but maybe what should, what should we be doing? Where should we be pouring our time, our resource, our energy into? Uh, how do we go forward as the church and help turn that corner by God's grace? You know, uh, one of my professors, John Warwick Montgomery, used to say prophecy is very difficult, especially about the future. Mm. And yeah, so when you right. think of uh, <laughs> what we are going to face, very hard. Yeah. Things can dramatically change, you know, yeah. one world war. Yeah. One nuclear device, all kinds of things mm -hmm. can suddenly change the direction we mm -hmm. take. But the church should always be prepared, whether catastrophe or not, mm -hmm. to prepare its young and its very young. Mm -hmm. A church's future is going to be defined by what's going on with its young people and with its junior highs mm -hmm. and with its children. Mm -hmm. You know, I was. you go into the Islamic world and you'll meet people with Five children, six mm -hmm. children, seven children, mm -hmm. eight children, yeah. ten children, twelve children. Yeah. What are we doing with our children? We're mm -hmm. killing them. Mm -hmm. We're killing them in the womb. Mm -hmm. We don't even think of the future. Mm -hmm. And so what we are really doing is yeah. pre presenting a vacuum for, the, for this kind of movement to take place. Muhammad mm -hmm. had a very sophisticated way of thinking. We underestimate his thinking. Mm -hmm. His thinking was migration. Move, migrate, move this worldview into other cities. Mm -hmm. That's how you will change the numbers game. And if we don't prepare our young and we don't raise our families and we don't teach our children, we are going to be left without a culture to defend. Mm -hmm. The numbers and odds are already stacked mm -hmm. against us. Here's the point, I think, Matt. Why did people like me come to Canada? All right, I was 20 years old. My brother was 22. I remember being interviewed by the Canadian consulate then, and they asked the question, why are you wanting to go to Canada? Mm -hmm. We were interviewed mm -hmm. before we were given a visa, rightly mm -hmm. so, yeah. because we were coming into another culture. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget my older brother's answer mm -hmm. to the question. He was only 22. He mm -hmm. surprised the interviewer. He said, uh, I think in English. Hmm. What was he saying? Your values, yeah. which you bring through your language yeah. and through the structure for the past, is the value place I want to go to. Mm -hmm. And the values that have shaped the West drew the rest of the world to itself. Mm -hmm. That's a reality. Mm -hmm. Today, we are facing those values in absence. Mm -hmm. if the, for example, if I walked through the streets of Toronto when I came, you'd see the newspapers, all right? There was no slot machine but there was a box in which you could put the money. You pick up a newspaper, put the money, and you walk away. I remember my brother saying, hey, you know what? If this were on our street in Delhi, yeah. not only would there be no money, there wouldn't even be the newspapers. The same guy would have picked it up and gone down the road mm -hmm. and sold it mm -hmm. because we lived with a different value structure. Mm -hmm. And India is working at it. Mm -hmm. India is trying its best to rebuild its values, to turn away from corruption. The West had values. Mm -hmm. Those values were from the Judeo-Christian worldview. They weren't brought about in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. If we don't return to the values, if we don't return to the source of those values, we will end up with a corrupt culture as well, mm -hmm. and the future will be bleak. In the church, mm -hmm. in our homes, we need to think young. We need to think our children. Mm -hmm. We need to prepare the nation with the children in its mm -hmm. mother's womb. We have to recalculate all over again how we want to think of the future. Mm -hmm. And that is key to what is our moment of opportunity. Dr. Zacharias, thank you. 
thank you so much for your time, uh, for, for giving us your, your energy, for pouring into us last night and, and again today. It, it is such a great gift. Thank you so much. We pray. We pray for your longevity. We pray for your team, for, for the whole team at RZIM and all the work that you're doing all over the world. Thank you for that. I